My man convenience you. Well, I'm not gonna say that. It's never an inconvenience. We stood up in the clubs all night. We sure can stand up for God. Turn with me to the book of John, the Gospel of John, the eleventh chapter. Hallelujah. You know, it's amazing how for seven for seven days the woman of God was doing okay. When you go over to the Caribbean and and ain't no uh, pollen and all that stuff, wasn't no allergies, wasn't no problems. As soon as we hit the United States, my God, her eyes started watering, Bishop, nose started running. She immediately, first lady, took sick. It's amazing. She had no problems for a whole week. And as soon as she hit the American soil, she looked at me and tears was running down her eyes. She wasn't crying, just, you know, pollen and all them allergies and stuff. She bought all that stuff. And, and she slept all day. And she let me know, baby, I'm sorry, my God, but I'm not feeling well. And, of course, my daughter's here. And, uh, but she do. And she's watching online, my God, all is well, all is well, all is well. Uh, the enemy is alive. My wife is healed. And all those, my God, why are we standing? Why are we standing? Before I forget, because there's many that has reached out and let me know that they was battling. So, Father God, I pray that you bless those that are battling in their body right now father god we have several members true sons and true daughters my god that would love to be here father god but because of their physical sickness father god we pray right now lord for that gout father god a grout however you said father god to be healed in the name of jesus father god i pray for all these allergies and headaches father god and physical elements father god who oh, my god is attacking the body of christ here at the going off of christ family that you bring healing because we can decree it and declare it because your word says we are healed according to your strength Father God and so Father God we're asking and standing on behalf of our brothers and sisters Father God and my sons and daughters Father God that they be healed according to your will Father God we thank you Father God for that in advance Father God we got faith to believe for them and stand in the gap with them Father God in Jesus precious name we pray come on and say amen everyone amen, amen. Uh, my daughter wanted me to make sure <laughs> she probably gonna smile she said daddy you need to make sure you give me some credit for how you look today I can't get nobody <laughs> Say nothing right there. That's the sense of humor. Yeah, I love my daughter. She's a straight soldier. Let's give God a hand for my daughter. Come here, Nyla. Come here. Come here. Y'all thank God for my baby. Yes, that's my daughter. Amen. Y'all look at my baby. Getting ready to graduate from my God from college, Pastor. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I forgot what she gonna be. What you gonna be? Respiratory ther respiratory therapist. I'm so proud. She reminded me of what Sharita Jakes and Bishop T.D. Jakes' daughter went through. Look at her today. The comeback is always sweeter than the fall. That's not for her, that's for y'all as well. The man of God just said, y'all to thank God for what he got you out of, that you got yourself in. Thank God for my baby, my God. My son too, should have been here, but it's all good. How many of y'all got sons that's working it out? Let me see your hand. Daughters too, amen. The Gospel of John, the 11th chapter. Wife said, baby, you shouldn't preach this rest. I, I thought about it and I wrestled with it. And uh, Bishop told me, you don't want to be out of your pool pit two consecutive weeks in a row. That's the principal son. It's not good to constantly be out the pool pit. Did y'all catch their pastors? Amen. Amen. So I went ahead and pressed in, got in about 11 something, went home, took us a bit, and they got straight to the church and got before God and began to seek and see what direction God wanted to take me. I thank God for my son, Pastor Dean. He preached a good message on Easter. Amen. I finally got to look online yesterday while I was getting my manicure and look at it. Worship was good and so forth. And uh, are you looking for uh, God? What was the title? Looking for Christ in dead places. My God, are you looking for Christ? Are you looking for something in dead places? Mm, that was powerful. Amen. Amen. So I'm coming up out of the book of John, the 11th chapter, starting at verse number 38. When you have it, please say amen. amen. And the word of God reads, reading from the New Living, Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Verse 39 says, Roll the stone aside. That's Jesus saying that. Jesus told them, but Martha. Oh, I know we got some Marthas in this church. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. Lord, he has been dead for four days. 
the smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you? He's talking to everyone in here right now. Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? Not confess, believe. So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always heard me. Look at that faith statement. But I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. Father God, thank you for the few minutes that I have. Lord, drop principles from your kingdom. Who my God, encourage your people, Lord. Speak to some Lazarus this morning. Lord, we are willing and ready to come forth. We thank you, Lord, that you love us enough to come speaking in our tomb. Come forth. And so we will do that this, after, this morning, Father God. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Come on and say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. My God, I'm so excited. My God, I'm going to get going in this way, but it's good. I think this is timely, strategic, and timely, my God, the Sunday after Easter. My father said, my God, that was a bold statement for you not to be here on Sunday morning. It speaks a lot of trust to the leadership Amen. of the church. Pastor Dean, you sure look good, son. Come here, son. You really look good, man. Well, I tell you. Shake my hand, man. It's an honor. Amen. Y'all know pastor is very strategic when he do things. Because if you're looking for tradition, this ain't that. If you're looking for someone to always, my God, uh, stick to a schedule, this is not that. My assignment in life, and I always say it every Sunday, every Wednesday, and even when I'm not in the pulpit, is to build people and allow God through me to change lives. That is my mission, and I will never, ever detour from that mission. And so, my God, that comes through many, through, new, through many avenues, through many ways that God will use me to build people and to change lives. And one of the ways, my God, especially in the African-American culture, we have it bad. And my father, who is a Caucasian man sitting on the front row, taught me this at a man's encounter. We in the African-American culture is very bad, bad at affirming our men. That's right. People need to be affirmed. People need to be Appreciate it. Like the wife told me yesterday, people matters. Look at your neighbor and say, you matter. Amen. Amen. This is a story many of us, my God, that we just read are quite familiar with. However, I would like to bring a few commands that Jesus gave we should take, that we should take heed to. So point number one, let's move to the screen. Point, the first thing you have to do in order for God to do what he want to do in your life, you got to remove. You got to remove. And so the title of the sermon is, Come Forth. I want to talk to a different type of person today. I want to talk to some people that's real and honest and understand that there's some caves and there's some things that's in the way of them and getting to God. Do I got a witness out there? Amen. There's some things that we need to let go. There's some things that we need to allow the spirit of the living God, my God, to roll away out of our life so that we can get to Jesus. Come on, somebody. Are y'all with me so far? And so the first thing that you and I have to do, you have to remove. According to verse 38, it says, Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across his entrance. Jesus said, roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. Jesus, more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was, called, it was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And he said, roll the stone away. He said, the stone was the only thing that stood between Jesus and Lazarus, and the Lord wanted it removed. So I want to say, Lord, right there, I'm going to teach you today. I don't feel like doing no shouting unless God say, come on, somebody. So I want you to ask yourself right now, while you're taking notes, what stone is in the way? I'm going to say, Lord, right there. 
because I guarantee you we all got one, if not 20. In order for God to do what he's trying to do and needing to do, and even what you desire him to do in your life, y'all stay with me, you're going to have to make a decision. God said, roll away the stone. You and I, I and you are going to have to make a decision, my God, to begin to roll away. To begin to remove things, my God, that we know that are blocking and hindering us from getting to Jesus. All of us want to experience his will. All of us want to experience his touch. All of us want to experience the promises. All of us want the blessings of the Lord because they make it rich and they add no sorrow. We want a lot of things, my God, Bishop from the Father, my God. But we're not willing to do one simple principle, roll away the stones. Remove stuff that's interfering. Remove stuff that's blocking you. Remove stuff, my God, that you know that is a weight. You got to take it and cast it off or you lay aside every weight and seeing that do so easy beset you. Some things, as my father taught me, you got to cast off. You need to cast some stuff off of you, my God, because it's interfering with your progress in God's kingdom. Do I got a witness out there? So how many of y'all can agree with me, my God, that we got some things that we have to remove? Notice God is not going to remove it. You have to remove it. I have to remove it. We talking about we waiting on God. No, no, God is waiting on you. Make a decision. I said before you, life and death, blessings and curses, choose life. Some of those things that we're not doing, my God, is we're choosing death over life. And if you begin to remove, begin to remove, I'm redundant. If you begin to remove some of those things that's blocking you, I promise you, you will have more satisfaction out of the spirit. You will see promises begin to manifest that you didn't think would manifest if you just do one simple principle, remove. Remove. It's real simple. It's real simple. But you got to make a decision. In life, you're going to have to make a lot of decisions, a series of decisions. Decisions leads to destiny. So if many of you want to reach your destiny, many of you want to operate in what God created you and purpose you, the purpose for you to do in life, but you're going to have to make a decision to remove things that you know that's hindering. And so if you are writing or taking notes, then you ought to be writing some of those things down that you know you need to remove. Jesus couldn't do anything in Lazarus' life until they removed the stone. So when he walked up to the cave, my God, to keep things in context, my God, before Jesus could do anything, my God, they had to remove. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. God is trying to get you to remove some things so he can begin to operate in your life. That which you are holding on to, <laughs> oh, my God, is the very thing that's hindering God from doing what he want to do in your life. And notice this right here. Thank you, Holy Ghost. He's not going to move it. You got to remove it. So you're praying, you believe in God, you're speaking in tongues, but will you remove Hmm? You saying, God, I want to be free, then remove. God, I want to be healthy, remove. God, I want more of you, remove. God, I want to experience you at a deeper level, intimate level, remove. It's elementary, but it's very practical, and it's very, it has major implications in your life if you just begin to remove. Again, let me see the hands. How many got to remove something? So we know we're talking to the right crowd this morning. Come on, let's give God a hand right quick. Notice that Jesus didn't say destroy the stone. We aren't just dealing with sin issues. Let me help you with this. The reason why I put this in there. Because many of us think that we tend to focus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. We tend to focus on the sin aspect. But it's not always sin. When people come down to the altar, it's not because they are in sin. See, I'm trying to say sometimes you just want to get closer to God. Can I come to the altar? Can I worship? Or can I come cry because I'm just in love with God? Because I'm just grateful? Because I'm just thankful? But what I want you to understand, don't focus on just the sin. Jesus says the little foxes that destroy the vine. How about being inconsistent? You got to remove that. How about being always late as Christians? Remove that. How about not keeping your word? My God, how about not operating integrity? Come on. How about posting one thing on Facebook, but your lifestyle is something else outside of Facebook? See, you got to focus on stuff like that. Because uh, God is calling us to a lifestyle. Come on, somebody. I know most pastors don't preach about it, but lifestyle still matters. Holiness still matters. Come on, somebody. I can't get nobody to say nothing right there. And so I don't want y'all to focus on the big things. I don't want y'all to focus on the big things. How about, my God, being somebody that you're not? How about being a public success and a private failure? Come on, sir, make a point. I, was, the, I don't want you to focus on, you know what I'm saying, the drinking and, and you went to the club and, and you slept with somebody that wasn't your husband. Don't focus on that because that's what he wants you to focus on. Little things like forgiving. That's not little, Bishop. Yes, I mean, Pastor, yes, it is. It's little compared to Jesus. You won't forgive because you're trying to do it. You can't forgive. You got to forgive through Christ. The Bible says put to death the deeds of the flesh by way of the spirit. You're trying to conquer stuff by the flesh. You got to be a flesh gives way to flesh and spirit gives way to spirit. So there's certain things that you have not removed out of your life because you're trying to move it. Instead of letting the spirit of God remove it for you. Not by my might nor by my power but by his spirit, saith the Lord. 
what you need to remove. Jesus couldn't call Lazarus forth until they removed the stone. Until they rolled away that which is blocking them. That what is interfering. What's interfering? What's interfering? What is robbing you of your peace? What is interfering with your healing? Be it emotionally, mentally, physically. I want us to think this morning. What do we need to remove out of our life? Oh my God. Mm. There may be things in our lives that we need to remove. And so you got to ask yourself, is there anything that needs to be removed in order for me to be closer to Jesus? It may be a relationship. It may be a job. I was telling one of the OIU students yesterday that the kingdom of heaven, uh, relationships has a lot to do with the kingdom of heaven. So if there's one area that the enemy will try to get in, Bishop, to try to destroy and demobilize the people of God, he wants to bring division to relationships. Because the kingdom, not church, y'all, the kingdom is made up of relationships. And so if the enemy can get in between, pastor, relationships, my God, he methodically just breaks down a body from within. If he can try to destroy, my God, the relationships. Because when the relationship is healthy, the church will be healthy. When the home is healthy, my God, the church will be healthy. Come on, somebody. Because the church is made up of homes. So that's why the enemy fights, my God, against relationship. He don't want harmony in a relationship. He don't want unity. That's why the Bible says, how can two people walk together except there be agreement? A lot of us are in relationships, but there ain't no agreement. Some of you have outgrown the relationship that you started out in. I'm not talking about husband and wife. I'm talking about even friends. Some of them is in the way. You got to remove some people, my God, to advance God's kingdom and develop in God's life. In your, in, come on. See, you see what I'm trying to say? And so, therefore, you got to, some of us, my God, have to make critical decisions today that there's some people that we know there's weights. We started up like this when we first met them, but over a period of time, we bent over. And so you got to know, my God, when God's grace has shifted, when God's grace has moved, they follow, my God, a cloud by day and fire by night. When God has shifted, you got to shift. You can't be afraid to make decisions when you're following God, baby. You got to be willing to obey God. You can't be dominated by the opinions of people. I'm trying to, oh, my God. You got to be willing to make decisions when you're following God. If you're going to go in and possess the land, if you're going to be what God has called you to be, you got to be willing to make some tough decisions in this thing called life. And some of them consist of relationships. Even though the kingdom is made up of relationships, you got to get away and disconnect from unhealthy relationships. You will never maximize your potential. You will never be what God has called you to be. You will never reach your fullest potential, my God, when you got a whole lot of unhealthy relationships attached to you. Why are you trying, my God, to build a relationship that's died? You got to roll away. Some of us started out running hard for God. And then here he come. God know my heart. Me and God got my own thing, but he ain't been to church since you've been. Since. Here she come. Here it come. You see what I'm trying to say? So you got to watch these things. And so again, what has come into your life since you have professed to be a man or woman of God that you know now you need to remove? It wasn't there when you first accepted Christ, but it showed up. What's there? What is interfering with the intimacy? What is interfering with your study time? As he taught me, my God, my God, dominate your schedule. Don't let your schedule dominate you. Some of us, my God, my God, we can't get intimate with God because our job. We got four or five jobs. That's not working smart. That's working. You got more. You got enough coming in, but you're just not being disciplined with what you got coming in. And so you might have to remove relationships. You might have to remove jobs. It's okay. Because some relationships is over. That don't mean that they're out of your life forever. If you have advanced, then advance. If they're going to make a decision to go with you, they're going to come with you. If not, let them walk. The man of God taught me, when you stop walking, I keep walking. Some people ain't called to walk with you in this season. You got to be cool with them being removed. And you ain't got to be mean. You ain't got to be nasty. Just keep walking in purpose. Keep walking in the will of God. And why God, you look back and they didn't fell off. Somebody give God a hand in the church. <laughs> My God. <laughs> Woo, Jesus. So I'm not saying have a nasty attitude. I'm not saying mistreat God's people, save the unsaved. This operating purpose and God will begin to clip. God will begin to remove people out of your life that's toxic towards your future or for your future. 
Do I got a witness out there? And so you got to look at hobbies. Hobbies. What hobbies are interfering? Ah, uh, that time that you spend on a hobby, uh, is it interfering with you flipping the pages? Do you got this sound in your house? This is one of the most important sounds you will ever hear. Right here. Other than job well done, my good and faithful sir. This sound right here tells me that you are invested in your purpose. You are invested in your future. You are invested in your destiny. Come on, somebody. I can't get nobody to say that right there. My God, that is a very poor. But so if you got hobby that's interfering with you getting to the word. Well, this is how you develop. See, I say you can't get new wine, my God, if you ain't giving yourself position and putting yourself in position to receive new wine. You can't get new revelation if you ain't flipping the pages. Come on, somebody. So you got to look at your hobbies. I know I'm a single mama. And I'm the only one taking my kids to the games and so forth. And so therefore, I don't have time to read. My God, I really ain't in church no more. I used to be in church, but the daddy's not there. I understand that. I'm not going to be insensitive with that. But sooner or later, you got to learn how to tell your children no. Because if you're not healthy, how can you give them something? You and I will stand before God to give an account for how we raised our children. Thank God that God gave me an opportunity to redeem myself. So therefore, you got to know, baby, I'm exhausted. Baby, I'm dying on the vine. Come on, somebody. Oh, my God. You got, I, got to, I got to back up, my God. You got to sit out this time. Maybe call your uncle, see if he'll do it. Call your auntie. But right now, I need to take a sabbatical. I need to get in God's presence. I need to flip these pages, my God. I got stuff that got attached to me. I got stuff that got back on me. Stuff that I used to be on top of that got back on top of me. I got to do something different. It's okay to say no. It's okay. Look at your name and say it's okay. Amen. One of the greatest things that the man of God taught me, my God, in, in pastor's meetings, that it's okay to say no. It's okay to say no. You got to learn that. Not only say no to people, how about say no to yourself? You know you can't afford it, don't buy it. As I've taught y'all, that credit card is them people's, even though your name is on it. Only use it when necessary. If you can't pay it back, then don't say no to yourself. That's why we can't give God what belongs to him because we're giving it to everybody else. Hobbies. Remove them if they're interfering with intimacy. If you have become stagnant, if you have lost your appetite, if you have lost your hunger, if you have lost your desire, you got to begin to examine yourself, as Paul said, and find out what is interfering, what, is interfering, what stone is in a way that need to be removed so that I can get back to that place in God where I desire his word, where I desire hearing his voice. Why I desire coming out of his presence and implementing what I learned in his presence. You got to get back to that. As you begin to remove some things, let, let me caution you that there may be some that are close to you that may, not, that may have some opinions. There are going to be some people when you begin to make decisions to change and transition and shift, whatever we put on it, uh, there's going to be some people like, uh, what you doing that for? Oh, you all too good for me now? Oh, you think you better than me now? So you got to be ready for that too. The late doctor always said, y'all hear me say it all the time, the second greatest miracle that happened to Dr. Miles Rowe, he said, my God, he got delivered from the opinions of people. You can't do what God called you to do if you're so people-focused. See what I'm trying to say? I remember when the men of God birthed Greenwood Christian Center, now known as Transformation, my God, Church, my God, TC, as Miss Melvin called it, my God. Uh, 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 what this white man coming to North Tulsa, all they're going to do is steal all of our members. You'd be surprised at what the man of God had to walk through to be who he is today. But thank God he was secure enough in his calling. Mm. And he heard God's voice in private. Mm. He heard God's voice in private, my God. And when he came up out of private, my God, who, my God, he was able to go in public and execute, my God. Oh, my God, he was able to go in public and execute that what God told him to do. And so when he began to face opposition, I'm still with the sermon, I promise you. When he began to face opposition, my God, he was able to forge through. He was able to press through. He was able to stay on his post, my God, in spite of all the animosity, in spite of all the lies and stuff that the man of God had to walk to to do business in North Tulsa, my God. And I thank God that God thought enough of me to bless me with a father, my God who understood, my God, my home, my, my boy, don't get me started up in this church. Hey, my God. Oh, my God, I thank God. And so going off to Christ Church, if the men of God hadn't got it in prayer, my God, y'all wouldn't be here today, so y'all to get up on your feet and give God some glory. Mm. Uh, just an opportunity. You know, I taught y'all, you never allow your father to come in and never honor him. <laughs> Principles. Never, ever get to the point where his voice don't matter. Thank you, Lord. 
Just a little transparency. I'm good at doing that. Thank you, daughter. My God, some of your closest friends and family know how bad your situation used to stink and how long you may have been in that situation. Don't let them keep you, my God, your family, your closest family, to removing things that God is telling you to remove. Don't let people cause you to hold on to stuff that you know. Keep bringing up your past. Keep telling you, my God, you remember this, because people are good at bringing up what you used to be. But that's why I've always taught y'all, if you don't want people to bring up your past, quit living your past. Quit living your past. The reason why they keep bringing it up because you keep putting it before them, Christians. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But get away from people. Get away from people. Get away from people. My God, that's always discouraging you. Always frustrating you. Always telling you what you can't do when you're standing up under a pastor, my God, and in discipleship classes, my God, and you're hearing what you can be and what you should be and how you should be occupied, how you should be dominate, how you should be ruling, but you got people that's close to you always telling you what you can't be. So you got a war going on. I'm hearing what's being taught in church, but then I'm listening to my closest companions, my family, my husband, my wife, my children, my uncle, my mama, my aunties, and different people that you value. My God, they're contradicting the voice of God. Is it all right to obey man or is it right to obey God? See what I'm trying to say? So you got to make some decisions. I know this word is teaching. You got to make some decisions today, not tomorrow, not next week, not in the next men's and women's discipleship meeting today then I'm going to remove some people. I have to. But you got to do it very strategically and pastorally and loving. And that just consists of falling back, operating in purpose, and walking. And when you look back, they won't be there. When they need you, go back and help them. And then keep walking. Somebody give God a hand. So what am I trying to say? You can't come forth until you remove. Jesus couldn't call Lazarus forth until he removed the stone. And my God, come on. And he had the disciples to remove the stone. Who do you got in your life that can remove something out of your life? Oh, do you got people putting it in your life, but they ain't got the power to remove it out of your life? I can't. Hey, hey. Who do you got in your life that can remove something? Who do you got in your life, my God, that can carry you to the top of the roof, my God, and dig a hole inside the roof and let you down right in front of Jesus while he preaches? Who do you got can carry you instead of you always carrying them? Do you got somebody that can roll away? Do you got somebody that can handle your ups and downs? Do you got somebody that can handle your mistakes, my God? Who do you got in your life that can help you remove the stones that's in your life? Oh, you the one always removing their stone, but then when they come, when you need them, they can't help you. Oh, I'm busy. <laughs> oh, I'm cur- uh, I, I, uh. Oh, this is in the house. I know it. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you, my God. Who do you got in your life that can remove something out of your life? Are you submitted enough and are you open enough to allow people that God has brought into your life to help remove stuff out of your life? See, that's a problem right there, too. It ain't that you ain't got nobody that can help you. You just won't let nobody help you because you're too prideful. Oh, y'all want me to get the microphone and work back and get it? Uh, So we got to look at the whole picture. God has brought many of you and brought people in your life. I told y'all, my God, divine connections. Strategic time and strategic moments. God has put people in your life. It's not happenstance that you hear. There's something that you need from going off of Christ Church. There's something that you need from your brother sitting in front of you or behind you or your sister in front. You got to understand, you got to be open for God to use people in your life to help you remove stuff out of your life. You, you, I, there's certain stones I couldn't carry. I wouldn't know how to operate in who I am today without that right there. That's my Moses. Come on, I can't get nobody to say nothing right there. And you need some people in your life to help you balance this weight, man. You got to need people in your life, sons and daughters, men and God, women of God, to help you carry this thing called life. You got some stones that you need help getting removed. If it's an addiction, get around somebody that's delivered from what you're struggling with. That's why he's in your life, to help you remove that addiction. But see what helps us? Pride. You sung about it, son. I will. We want God's everything, but our will is in the way. I don't need nobody. I got this. One of the greatest lessons I told a young man of God when I met him back there in my, in my chambers back there, I tell him, whatever you do, don't let Bishop McIntosh's uh, voice get to the point where it don't matter in your life. Don't let it get to the point. I done seen so many of it happen. I thank God that I understand covering, submission, and it's just good when you got a witness. It's good when you got a witness, Sherry, my God. When you got somebody who is known across the world, baby say, that's my son. I heard this young pastor on TV uh, 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 mentioning your name. Who is that? That's my son. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Amen. You know how many people dropping names in this ministry? That's my son. Are oh, you yeah. talking about Juju? He walked with a limp. 
He on traditional. He come out the streets. He gonna be able to tell them all of it. They'll be like, okay, that's your son. <laughs> that's your son. My God, do you got a witness? Do you got somebody that can help you remove stones in your life? God wants to remove some stones, and it don't take them long. I can give an altar call right now, and many of you will come if you're serious, because you know some things that's keeping you from getting closer to God. The woman with the issue of blood, my God, uh, ceremony, my God, uh, uh, wasn't supposed to be in the presence because she was bleeding. She was considered unholy. Uh, but she didn't let that matter. When you get to the point where you're desperate enough, you care less what somebody think about you. Uh, you're willing to break all the odds, break all the customs, break all the tradition. My God, the woman of God was so desperate, she crawled to get to Jesus. Are you that desperate? Are you going to continue to go through life dragging stones? The late Dr. Miles Rowe always says, easier for people to exist in chaos than it is to live in freedom. Some of us is terrified of real freedom. And I'm not talking about physical freedom from prison. I'm talking about freedom. Some of us don't even know what peace feel like for 72 hours. Some of us, my God, we so used to chaos to where we create problems so we can have some chaos. We move. Ooh, Lord have mercy. Uh, I don't want to labor. Let's go to point number two. Then you got to respond. When God said remove, now you got to do something. Uh, so now you can't just talk Christ. Now you got to operate in Christ. Come on. Look at verse 43. Mm-hmm. Let's go to it. Verse 43 says, uh, I need a bigger Bible going off of Christ. I'm getting blind. Let me see. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands, feet was bound in grave clothes. His face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told him, unwrap him and let him go. Are y'all with me so far? Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The dead man came out. Watch this, write this down. New life comes only at the heels of something dying. <laughs> New life comes mm, only at, on the heels of something that died. What needs to die? Some of those very things that you need to remove needs to die. The Bible says, let the seed fall into the ground. Bishop McIntosh said, about it alone. You and I, as I told new, new members orientation, you got to get to the point where you're willing to grow, my God, in dirty places. You take a seed and you place it on the ground in the dirt. A seed don't grow on top, it grow in the dirt. You got to be willing to grow in the dirt. What needs to die in your life this morning? What needs to die so that you can live? Who needs to experience life? You think you're living, but you're not living until you got a relationship with the vine. Until you're abiding in Christ, John 15, 1 through 5, you're not living, you're just existing. What needs to die? Who needs to be let go? What needs to be separated from? What circumcision need to take place? What needs to be renovated in your mind? My God, my God, is your self-esteem too low? Can you believe God for what you're praying for? Do you believe you confess him or do you believe it? Do you believe that he can do what you're asking him to do in your life? What has to die so that some things in your life can live? Ain't you tired of suffering? Ain't you tired of going through the formalities? Do you really want to get to the point where you see the promises of this Bible manifest in your life? Do you really believe you can have what God said you can have? These are questions that you and I have to ask ourselves. Do you want to see? How many want to see the full manifestation of God's account of glory in your life? And so in order for God to do that, you got to remove some things. Come on, somebody. And you have to respond. It isn't enough just to hear from Jesus. We must be obedient to the commands. If we look close, Lazarus was commanded to do something that no one had been asked to do before. Um, uh, Jesus walked up to the tomb. Roll it away. Lazarus, yeah. come forth. When I was at the YMCA watching one of my, form, my, my, my former disciples' son play basketball, his son, his, grand, his son, Tory's son, I'm sitting off in there and Pastor Champ walk in. Pastor Champ, being serious, was my Lazarus. There's some things that Pastor Champ needed to remove out of his life. Here it is, Pastor Champ been knowing me since I was seven years old. Him and my second oldest brother was best friends growing up all through high school and so forth. He knew all of my family. He been knowing me since I was a little kid. But he was my Lazarus. And when he got connected to me, come on, the things that he was struggling with, God unlocked and delivered him from. So what am I trying to say? What Lazarus is around you that you need to speak to? Would he use a seven-year-old kid that, that you growed up with? To? 
Go on, Juju, go on, boy, go on. He said, Whose deliverance is tied up to your response? Whose healing? Real talk. Who's next? Who's freedom? It's tied up. Because you're not responding and you're not removing. Are you with me so far? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Lazarus would come forth. He had to do something that didn't make sense to the natural mind. Has God asked you to do something that don't make sense? What do a five-and-a-half-year-old church, what are they doing trying to purchase a $1.1 million facility with only 200 and some people? Who does that? Pastor Tim bought his mama on the property last Thursday, Thursday before last, and she, she wanted to see the church. So she pulled up on the property, and mama said, what are you doing in them people's church? So he drives up to the window and showed a line going over Christ's line, and Pastor Sam said, Mama, people don't let you put that, that symbol on the doors. So he pulls over across the street to the house. She said, what are you doing at these people's house? This is serious. Yeah. Mama, you're not understanding. This is our church. She broke down in the parking lot. My husband was up here with me watching Pastor Sam drive around the church. She says, Mama, broke down in the parking lot and started crying. She said, son, five and a half years. God and bless y'all with all this. Five and a half years. God would ask you to do something that don't make sense to the natural mind. But let me give you some balance and context of this. Before I pull the trigger, even though I'm a man in authority, I'm a man under authority. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I got the blessing from two trusted advisors, him and Eddie Miller, when he said it's a go, we went for it. If I'd have listened to the naysayers, Juju, you're going to be a pastor? Where you come from? See, all that. God would ask you to do something that's unnatural. It's kind of intuitive to the natural mind. What is God asking you to do that don't make sense? Good, because like God told him in the story, uh, what's going on with Lazarus, it's for the glory of God. See, God is trying to get you to do something because it's for his glory. It ain't about you, no way. This ain't about me, this is about God. Oh, my God, this property, my God, is about God. This ain't got nothing to do with Juju and where Juju come from. This got to do with God's kingdom. My God, the soul is being saved to go out, my God, and make other disciples to advance God's kingdom. That's what it's about. It ain't about me testifying. It's about God using me to build lives and transform people. About to say nothing like that. I understand that. And so, my God, what does God ask you to do that don't make sense? Uh, what, I could go on and on. I got several people like, God, why am I at that church? Why am I sitting up under that pastor? Man, that pastor ain't got nothing in common. Y'all heard me tell the story, but I ain't going to mess with it. What does God ask you to do that you're fearful of? Because it don't make sense to the natural mind. That's how God operates. If it makes sense, then you're going to take the glory. If it don't make sense, you're going to give him the glory. <laughs> hey, come on, y'all. If you just take some of the principles, it ain't no deep philosophical word. You just take the principles that you're hearing and apply them, and you'll see your life shift in 30 days. You'll see your life transform in 30 days. All you got to do is take what the Spirit of God has given you through your pastor and implement it into your life. You got to respond after we move stuff. It's not enough to remove something, now you got to respond. It's one thing to get free, it's another thing, can you stay free? After God removed the stone, my God, and Brian called you forth, can you maintain your freedom? Many people start out getting free, but they end up in bondage again. What is God asking you to do? Make sure it's God and not flesh, though. Make sure it's his will, not your will. Mm. Watch this. To God... Our comfort is the prison that produces more cycles of stagnation. And I quote T.D. Jakes. To God, our comfort is the prison that produces more cycles of stagnancy. See, we want to be, com we want to be comfortable. We don't want to be pushed. We don't want to be challenged. We don't want to be asked to be inconvenienced. We want, my God, all the platform without sacrifice. Uh, my God, we want all the glory without submission. I can't get nobody to say nothing right there. My God. And so we, we, are, we, we want to be comfortable. And so, therefore, when God started telling us to respond, y'all stay with me, church. When God started telling us to respond, my God, we started backing up. 
My God, when God said push forward, we push back. My God, so what you got there, you got a flesh and spirit at war. Your spirit won't obey, but your flesh don't want to blame. My God, because you want to stay in the familiar. You want to stay comfortable, my God. Come on, somebody. And being comfortable, my God, is an enemy to progress. My God, as I taught y'all uh, Sunday before last, some of your greatest enemies, my God, is your past successes. Never rest on your past success because you got another devil you got to fight. You got another war that you got to bang with. Baby, I can't get nobody to say nothing right there. Woo, my God. And so, my God, are you stagnant because you want to be comfortable? Somebody need to hear me. You're not responding because you want to be comfortable. You feel like you have arrived in your mind. You feel like, my God, I feel like at times, my God, oh, my God, I'm going to use me because I don't want nobody to think, you know, none of us, let me say it like that, Holy Ghost, thank you. None of us has heard, job well done, my good and faithful. So you got work to do. You got praying to do. You got fasting to do. You got consecration. You got stuff that need to be done. But we don't want to move and respond, my God, because we want to stay stagnant because we want to be comfortable. I'm going to go through the vision, but I ain't going to be, I, I, I'm only going, when I graduate, I'm still going to sit. You go through discipleship at this church for nine and a half months, my God, to get activated to, my God, to get in function in what God created you to be. You learn along the way what God created you to be, and then you start implementing that into society. Many of us go through the vision, we come sit down on God. Well, at least I did that. Pastor ain't got to say, no, I went through the vision. What transformed in your life? Are you operating in function of who God called you to be? My goal is to help you be what God has called you to be. I'm not interested in membership. I'm interested in purpose. You got a whole lot of members everywhere, but are you operating in purpose? And some of us, my God, know what our name is, know what God created us to do, but because we want to be comfortable, because we know what God has called us to do is going to inconvenience us. We know, my God, that what God has showed us, that what we have dreamed about. Oh, my God, that what God has spoken into our life. We know it's going to require major sacrifice. It's going to require major shifting. I'm about to let go of some people. I'm about to let go of some things. I'm about to shift out of this job. I might have to be homeless for a season. I might have to go broke for a season. But I know God told me to do it, and I don't want to do it because I want to stay familiar. I want to stay comfortable, my God. And in the midst of that, you're dying while you're sitting in the church house. Mm, mm, mm. Therefore, because you want to be comfortable, God will do this. He will disrupt our conveniences and stir up trouble to stimulate what has and stir up trouble to stimulate what is laying dormant in your life. God is always trying to move you to grow. God is trying to always move you to develop. God always want to push you to your purpose. God always trying to develop you so you can be what God has called you to be. He died. Because you have a purpose in you. That what could have killed you didn't kill you because God have need of thee. That which you have overcome that most people have lost their mind about, it's the reason why God brought you out. As the young pastor said, that what you got yourself in trouble and God had enough mercy and love to bring you out, my God, God has need of that. That what used to be on top of you that's now up under you, God have need of that. That past broken relationship and all the stuff you've been through, God have need of that. Ain't nothing wasted down. Ain't nothing wasted in the will of God. Who made your principles, Bishop? Thank you for teaching me how to teach with principles and not for hype. Emotionalism will cost you your soul. I mean, people want emotionalism, but they ain't getting no principles. Ain't interested in it. Build lives. Build people and change lives. God will send a disruption. Some of us need to be disrupted. Be careful. Be careful. God will stir up some trouble. Get in the boat, and then a storm rose. God knew what was going to happen. That's why he told him to get in the boat. As Bishop taught me, storms locate your faith. Some of y'all, y'all done lost your faith, so he got to send a storm to stir you. <laughs> he's trying to get some Lazarus to come forth. <laughs> I said he's trying to get some Lazarus to come forth. See what I'm trying to say? So he got to stir up some trouble because you're comfortable. You got a good 401K. You got your little C30 bins. Come on, somebody. You got a $20, $22 an hour with y'all. You got a nice little house. See what I'm trying to say? And you're comfortable. You go to church, you clear your conscience, you may give, you even pay your tithes. Thank you, Holy Ghost. You even pay your tithes. And you're comfortable. That's the formality of religion. That's not your purpose. What is your purpose? You don't live till you operate in purpose. What is your purpose? You got a job, you got a house, you got a 401k. All that's a blessing. Thank God that you got it. That's not God, why God created you. God created you. My God, to have those things, but also to use those things to advance God's kingdom. Who need a place to stay? Who need to be picked up and brought to church in their college? You driving in with cold AC. Who walking down the street, my God, while it's 100 degrees outside and you driving past them, my God. See, outlook determines outcome. 
God bless you to be a blessing, baby. I said, God blesses you to be a blessing. And so some of us ain't got too comfortable. Oh, my God, the blessing is in remembrance. Some of us forgot, my God, what it once used to be like and where you once were sleeping at. Oh, uh, my God, do you remember when you slept in an abandoned house? Do you remember, my God, when you had no furniture? Do you remember when you opened up the icebox and wasn't nothing there? Do you remember sugar sandwich? Do you, mean a, do you remember peanut butter and jelly? Do you remember popcorn? Do you remember when you had no shoes and one pair of pants? Uh, do you remember when you had no air conditioner when you had a box fan sitting in the window? Do you remember, my God, when the air conditioner broke down and it was 105 outside? And your neighbor said, come over here and stay with us tonight. Don't get me started. Have you forgotten? And you have become stagnant. Have you forgotten? And become stagnant. The blessing is in. The blessing is in. The blessing is in. Don't forget like the Israelites, they forgot. And when you begin to forget, what you find yourself doing is going back to bondage. The python and bitch. Let's go a little deeper. Oh, my God, got a few more minutes. I want you to understand that sometimes God will stir up trouble, not to break you, but sometimes to break you, but to make you. Yeah, because sometimes you got to die. And the only way it's going to die, you got to send you through a storm. You got to allow that that you're praying not to come, to come. Sometimes God got to do this. Y'all look at me. Everybody look at me. Because he loves you enough and he has need of you, sometimes God got to do this. So when you talking about God said he'd never leave you nor forsake you, he ain't left. He just turned his back. And while he's turned his back, he's standing right beside you. I taught y'all, he right there in the storm with you. He right there in the trial with you. He right there in the circumstance with you. But he know there's a purpose in that, so therefore I got to. So when you feel like giving up, just remember. When you're walking around the house and everybody went crazy, just. When you're on the job and the supervisor went off on you, just. When you wonder why your car keep breaking down all of a sudden. When you wonder why the bank said they were going to give you the money, all of a sudden they didn't give it to you. You said, God, whatever your will be done, let your will be done. You're so excited, and the bank was going to give it to you. All of a sudden they tell you, say, I'm sorry, we thought we could, but we couldn't. Because, see, what happened is we begin to worship the created thing more than the creator of the thing. So God said, I got to disrupt some stuff. Uh, we got too many idols. In our lives, you got to re move, you got to respond so you can come forth. Have you ever found yourself being commanded to do something that didn't really make sense, as I told you, to the people around you? That's because God is trying to write these three down. I'm done. He's trying to remake, remold, and renew you. Everybody, God is always trying to remake, remold, and renew. Everybody, God got his hands on you, God loves you enough. That he won't let you die in your mess. So he's trying to remake you. So he'll send a storm. He'll allow you to go through a trial. He's trying to wake up that which is laying dormant. Some of you have given up on your dreams. Some of you have given up on your schooling. Some of you have given up, my God, on their career. My God, you've walked away from it because things got hard. We so used to this microwave faith. We so used to everything being convenient. We don't want to go through nothing. My God. Ooh, my God. It's good for me that I was afflicted, says the writer. Come on, somebody. You got to be willing to go through stuff. You got to be willing to pay a price. We want everything, but we don't want to pay no price for nothing that we want. And so God knows if I give it to him, all he's going to do is worship it. So I got to withhold. That what we ask asking for. God wants to give it to you, but he knows if he give it to you, it might destroy you. So you got to withhold. See, I'm trying to say you ain't ready for Many of us is frustrated because we won't remove, we won't respond, and we're mad. But God got to withhold, withhold some things from us because we ain't ready. Don't you know, prodigal sons, that if God, you get your inheritance too soon, you're going to destroy yourself? Yeah. If God give, give us everything we pray for, a lot of us wouldn't be sitting here. This church would be empty. Yeah. Prodigals, he wasn't ready. So you got to ask yourself, are you ready for what you're praying for? Is your foundation strong enough to handle the weight of what's your life? Come on, the weight of your life. Are you ready for that? Are y'all with me so far? Is this helping anybody so far? Okay. I'm going to give y'all point three and I'm done. After you remove, after you respond, you got to release. Loose them and let them go. Verse 44 says,
And the dead man came out, his hands, feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. As I read, Jesus told him, come on, T.D.J., loose that man and let him go. Everybody look at me. The title of the sermon is, Come Forth. Ain't you tired of living in dead places? Ain't you tired of being in dead relationships? Are you tired of going to jobs that's frustrating you? Are you tired of going to a job when you should be going to a career? Are you tired of living beneath who you are? Are you tired of acting and living like slaves when you should be kings and queens? God is saying, come forth. Remove, respond, and release. You got to make a decision to come forth. When the Spirit of God beckon y'all to come and get in the river doing worship, you responding. It don't stop right there. It's easy to come down here and shout. But you got to pay a price to live in obedience. I'm trying to help you. Have to pay a price to stand up here. Lazarus came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strings, strips of linen, and a cloth around his face. Jesus told him, take the grave clothes off and let him go. A miracle had taken place, but Lazarus was still quite limited. Ooh. You're free, but we still got stuff on us. I'm coming in. We're free, but we still got stuff in us. We're free, but we still got stuff going on around us. Are y'all with me so far? The miracle had taken place. But he was limited. Many of us has, my God, had great experiences with the Lord. But today we are limited by the things that have us wrapped up. You're free. But we wrapped up. And if you be truthful, we all got some grave clothes on. It might not be physical garments. Most of our grave clothes is in our mind. That's why I thank God for the missing ingredient. As I told the new members, uh, Bishop's brother, Ron McIntosh, who wrote uh, The Greatest Secret, but they did a new edition of Missing Ingredient because it deals with the renovation. It deals with the process of renewing your mind. A lot of our belief systems are out of order. A lot of our belief systems, my God, and that what we know and that what we learn and that what we experience and to be brought down to the altar and released. We're sitting with a lot of pain, frustration. We have a lot of unforgiveness and different things Self-limiting beliefs, low self-esteem, no confidence. Some of us don't even believe in ourselves. We have seen and dealt with poverty and such shame and abuse and so much stuff as people of God till we don't even believe that we can. You got to let it go. You got to remove three principles. You got to respond and you got to release. It's not enough to say the church ain't working. It's not enough to say your relationship with God ain't working. It's not working, and you're not benefiting because you're not responding. You're not releasing. You're not removing. God is waiting on you. God is waiting on me to do those three principles. Then you can come forth. Remember, he could not raise Lazarus from the dead until the stone was removed and Lazarus responded. Don't you know, Jesus, if he just said, come forth, everything dead, my God, would have came out. He spoke specifically to Lazarus. He called Lazarus' name. God is causing you, Lazarus. God is specifically this morning calling your name. Not your neighbor, not your mama, not your daddy. He's calling you, church. He is telling you, it's okay to be a Lazarus, especially when you're trying to come forth. Thank God I was a Lazarus sitting in a 6 by 9 prison cell at 1.30, 1.15 in the morning. I said, God, April the 3rd of 1995, God said, Lazarus, come forth. And he's still calling me forth. You don't just come forth one time. You got to continue to show up. You got to continue to come forth. You got to make it an everyday commitment. You got to stay determined. You got to stay. My God, the Bible says God shows himself faithful to those who are faithful. It's a continued decision to come forth. Many of you came forth one time and you ain't been back yet. Come on, somebody. But today, you get to come back and release, baby. Mm. Let me close this out and get y'all out of here. My God. Mm. Uh, write this down. Please write this down. His feet. Uh, even though he was a miracle walking, because remember he was dead, Jesus stayed an extra two days. So in total, the Bible says he was dead for four days. By now, he's stinking, Bishop. Uh, ask yourself, have you ever thought about I'm going to get you out of here. Let me teach you. They said, uh, Jesus, your friend Lazarus. Jesus loved Lazarus. Uh, Christian, uh, but when he heard Bishop that his son had fell, fallen asleep, they said dead, but he was asleep. Jesus said, you know what? I'm going to stay two more days. Oh, y'all stay with me, church. Uh, 
Well, how would that make you feel when you're calling on God and God's doing this? Uh, some of you feel like that today. Uh, when you get the news, Pastor Tedrick, uh, that something is going on and, and Pastor stay two more days. They told me on Monday, but I decided I ain't going to show up to Thursday. You're going to say, you know what? I need to have a talk with you, Pastor. I got a real problem. My God, Pastor Tim told me, my God, that he personally talked to you and you said you was coming, but you stayed two more days. And you know I was in a dire situation. You know I was dealing with a miracle, my God. I needed a miracle to happen. I needed my pastor at that time, my God. And you stayed two more days, my God. Uh, but how you going to tell me you my pastor and you stayed two more days? How you going to tell me you left me? How can I follow you when I really needed you? You stayed two more days, uh, Oh, my God, I'm talking to somebody. I'm trying to lay this thing before I close this ship, Bishop. My God, how can you tell me you love me when you left me two more days? It's a reason. Do y'all want to know? Do y'all want to know? See, that's why you got to know in whom and what you believe in. Oh, my God. See, if you really don't know God, uh, you'll want to respond right then. But see, God knows I got all authority, Pastor. Bishop, I got all power. Uh, this is for the glory. I have to stay two more days. <laughs> so if I need a total of four, why? Because I need a whole lot of people together. Uh, you know how you do when you get a funeral. Hey, everybody got to come. Come on, somebody. All your family members you ain't seen in six years traveling in the town. Uh, you need a whole lot of people because God knew that I'm going to get the glory. Because mm. remember, my God, what Lazarus was going through, it wasn't because he died. It was because it was for the glory of the Lord. Some of the things you're going through when God turned his back, he got to wait because the right people ain't showed up yet. He got to wait, my God, because the person that's supposed to get this miracle, he ain't done yet. They, they ain't got the money for the plane ticket. They ain't got the money for the bus ticket. They ain't showed up yet. I got to wait till something such get done. I got to wait till she get done. I got to wait till your father that you ain't talked to in six years get done. Oh, my God, I got to wait for your mama to come back. He's waiting on certain people so he'll turn his. And he'll stay. And that's the two days. So, so now Lazarus is dead. And when Jesus called him forth, the miracle came. And he walked out, his feet. See, some of y'all don't know what this is, but there was some of y'all that do. See, in the penitentiary, this is called the penguin walk. Yeah, you shackled up, Bishop. You got your hands tied. You got your feet tied. So you can only go so far. Can I, can, can, I, can, I, can I show y'all something? I know I didn't went over, but let me show y'all something. Stay with me, y'all. Stay with me. Don't lose me. Oh, my God. See, some of us is like this in the spiritual realm. We a miracle. We, he delivered us from joys, but we. He brought us out that relationship, but we. We got the job, Bishop, but we. Our feet is shackled. Feet represents progress. Feet, Bishop, as you taught me, represents movement. Oh, my. Some of us ain't moving. Oh, we have the appearance of being alive, but we. Are you moving? Are you making progress? Are you moving towards purpose? Are you moving towards destiny? Are you operating that what God has created, my God, has saved you to do? My God, that's real movement. When you're doing what God created you to do, that brings fulfillment. Are you fulfilled? Yes, yes, yes. <sighs> His hands. God placed Adam in the garden, and the first assignment that he gave to mankind, mama, he said, take care of the garden. Work. If your hands is bound, you can't work. Yeah. Scriptures, we good at quoting it. We want to use it to, to, to offend somebody. Uh, if a man don't work, he don't eat. Okay, so you would tell him that because he ain't got no job. But when he comes stumbling home at 1.15 in the morning and trying to holler at you, why you don't tell him that then? Yeah. See, we can't use the scriptures, thank you, Holy Ghost. You can't use the scriptures to benefit you when you want it to benefit you. You knew he didn't work when you met him. So what you really want is somebody to help you take care of the kids and take the kids to football, but you didn't really want nobody to work. So if you still got your grave clothes on and you're a miracle and you're free physically and your feet are shackled, I'm coming in, and your hands is not free, you can't produce. Work produces. What are you producing? Write that down. Ooh, my Dr. Miles is in full force today, Bishop. What are you producing? What are you producing? Work produces fruit, church. 
Shake him if he won't get a job and you've been with him for three years. Do something different. Yeah. I'm on camera. I'm sorry. They're going to be, oh, I got bodyguards. I am promise you. Mm. His face. Uh-oh. His face. You can't watch. The Bible says, Jesus said, watch and pray. Watch. If your face is all covered up, you can't, you're not watchful. While you were sleeping. Bishop, pre, pre, while you were sleeping. You wide awoke, but you sleep spiritually. You're doing a whole lot of activity. Yeah, your, hand, your feet is free, and your hands is free, but you're not watchful. You got to keep your head on the swivel, as we say in the street, baby. You got to be willing to do a 360, and you got to be willing to turn it back around, baby, to a 180. Come on, somebody. You got to stay watchful. Are you watching your adversary? The Bible says, my God, the enemy swooped down on them. And before they knew it, my God, he was right upon them. Has the enemy got that close? You remember the famous movie, Sleeping with the Enemy? Yeah. I ain't just talking about sex. I ain't talking about, I ain't talking about, I'm just, are you sleeping with the enemy? Are you dating the enemy? Are we prostituting ourselves to the enemy? Yeah. I ain't just talking about sex. Don't take that out of context. Are you sleeping, prostituting yourself with the enemy? Has the enemy got that close to you where you can't even recognize it? Ah. Have you got that comfortable, my God, in your past achievements and who you know and what you do? My God, my God, where, where, where you ain't watching. You don't wake up, you, 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 we get to the routine, as Tony Evans say, you know, say we go to the same job, drive the same car, get out the same bed, wear the same clothes, sit at the same desk, come on somebody, talk to the same people, get out the job, get in the same car, drive down the same street, come on somebody, go to the same house, get home and sit in the same chair, get the same newspaper, watch the same channels, and then we go to bed to get up and do it all over again. Unproductive life. How watchful are you? Is the enemy coming in, taking away from us? That we supposed to be guarding. Are we so bitter and so upset because stuff is steady being taken from us. But we allow the enemy to come in and take it. Because we're not watchful. Think about it church. If your face is covered. You can't see nothing. Where you going? Look y'all. You're blinded. Get this image. Where you going? Oh Shanda Boshi. Y'all stay with me. I know. Where you going? Okay so now. My face is covered. My feet are shackled and my hands are. This is spiritual and even natural for a lot of us. Look at all this movement, Bishop. I ain't going nowhere. I got all this activity going, all this movement, but I ain't made no progress. <laughs> oh my God, I'm no farther alone. My God, I'm 50 now and I, my life still look. Mm, come on, somebody. I ain't making no progress yeah. in life. Is the enemy getting in? Let me give you this one. I got one more and I'm done. Wherever there's darkness, the enemy kingdom has legal access to any area in our temple where there's darkness in. Anywhere inside of your temple where there's darkness, sin habits, unrepentant hearts, wheels that's on the throne instead of God's wheel on the throne. Anywhere that stuff is, mother, the enemy has legal access. It ain't the devil. You giving it to him. We giving it to him. And the last one, his mouth, with your mouth. If I'm shackled, I'm covered, I ain't got no mouthpiece. My voice don't matter. If I say one thing, but my life don't match it, my voice means nothing. When it's going good, I may quote a scripture, but my coworkers see me when I'm going through on the job, cussing and talking crazy. Now my mouthpiece and my witness is ruined. Ah, come on, somebody. Ah. When your mouth is covered, you got no witness. Don't you know the power of the tongue? The Bible says you can call those things that be not as though they are. If you confess and believe, you shall be saved. When you have no voice, you don't matter. As I told the man of God again, when Bishop McIntosh's voice don't matter to you, you're pretty much in trouble. When there are certain people's voices, I teach my pastors and leaders up under me, when my voice don't matter, you're in trouble. When my voice don't matter, as he taught me, I use his mind. When he's in my presence, I give God the glory for him. When his voice no longer matter to me, our relationship is severed right then. There are certain people's voices that don't need to matter, and God's voice need to increase. And other people's voice need to decrease. But I ain't talking about that. Because some of us has disconnected from people where their voices still matter. Yes. Because we didn't like the pressure, 
We didn't like that they was pushing us. We didn't like that they was challenging us. We didn't like that they was loving us. Because, see, incorrection is love. See, incorrection, there is a component of love. Ain't that right, Pastor? See what I say? If you love me, help me. If you love me, correct me. If you love me, teach me. If you love me, show me. If you love me, model it for me. Teach me how to do it. Show me how to do it. Oh, come on, somebody. But we don't want to be taught that. Anytime your mouth is covered, you are rendered ineffective. You have no voice. Some of us, oh my God. It's in relationships with no voice. Mm. Yeah. When he quit, I quit, Bishop. Your voice used to matter. It don't matter no more. He used to love to hear you when you come home. When you come home now, he get in your car, your car and drive your car because he ain't got no job. We got some things that we need to remove. Then after you remove them, you got to respond. There's things that I have to come face to face with daily, even as a pastor. Here's another thing. You got your phone, son? Got your phone? Write this down. Another principle that I want to give you. I want to get one shot with you. Never get intoxicated off of your own harvest. Never let the people's voice ooh, become louder than God's voice in your life. Even in relationships, never let the significant other's voice become louder as the priest, prophet, and king of the home. Nobody's voice should matter and be louder than God's voice as the priest, prophet, and king. I don't want to mess with that, those three different functions. Each one of those offices require a different hat that you put on as a king. It's your domain. Whatever's going on, men, up under your roof, you allowing it. Every head bow. If you're not, if you hear this afternoon now, and you're ready to respond, you're ready to remove, and you're ready to release, you might not know Christ. Real talk, you might not know him. And you want to give your life to Christ, and you're not ashamed, because you see we transparent at this church. And the Spirit, my God, has set it up where you can receive salvation today. If that's you, please respond by the showing of your hands if you want to give your life to Christ. Is that anybody? Don't be ashamed. If there are some things that you need to remove and release, I want you to stand on your feet and come down to the altar. God, Jesus. Mm. Oh, Lord, thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Mm. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Mm. Mm. This ain't it. Remember, you may be comfortable in the natural, but you're stagnant in the spirit. You should be at the altar. Don't let your past accomplishments hinder you from coming forth. I'm going to wait on you. If you're struggling with fear, there's some decisions that you have to make. 
you got to be at the altar. If you know that your voice don't matter like it used to matter. If God's voice don't matter like it used to matter in your life, you ought to be at the altar. Mm, mm, mm. If hobby just interfered with you removing, you should be here. If there's some things that you know God has told you to do and you have not let go or you have not released, that may be people, that may be all kind of stuff, then you have an opportunity to come. Hey, Lord. Thank you. They responded. Thank you. Remember, my assignment is always to build people and transform lives. I don't preach for excitement, nor do I teach for approval. I teach by obedience to my Lord and my Savior. That's what matters to me. And when you preach the gospel, the people will come. When you preach truth, they will respond. When you feed the sheep, they will come eat. Boy, I'm giving y'all some principles, pastors and leaders. Just preach the gospel. You don't need all the theatrics. Just preach the unadulterated word, and they will eat. People are tired of eating contaminated food from the pool pits. Another principle Gary McIntosh taught me. I quote him because I'm dusty. I quote him because I thank God that I had him. I wouldn't be one man today without him. Thank you, Lord. I'm waiting. This last call, if you need to forgive yourself for some past mistakes, come. Some of us need to forgive ourselves. And while you're at the altar, communicate with God. I can't do it. Who need to forgive themselves? Who are stagnant? You've been through the vision four times, but you still ain't in purpose. <laughs> still dealing with fear. You should be at the altar as well. Lord, give me you. For those that has responded. Lord, give me you. Spend a few seconds saying, God, I want more of you. Give me you. I know what I need to remove. That's why Anything I came. Else can wait. And I also know what I need to release. That's why I came. Give me and so you got to be willing to do that now that you have come. If it's hobbies, hangups, habits, addictions, mindsets, low self-esteem, whatever it is that we got, because we all got our thing. I can't do it. My spiritual father, when he come and pray a blessing over you, can't do it for you. You have to do like Lazarus, and you have to respond to the hurry on call of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you know you're not saved, and you're amongst the crowd that's standing up here, you're going to have an opportunity to give your life to Christ. If you're backslidden and you didn't want nobody to know, but you're amongst the crowd that's standing up here, you're going to have an opportunity to repent and come back to the Father. Oh, my God. Today is a day of salvation. This is what Christ is concerned about. He's concerned about his people that has come to receive, my God, importation from the Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Deliverance. Deliverance. Anyone else? Before I release the prophet over the house, anyone else? Who needs to say, God, who am I? It's me, God. It's me, God. Thank you, Lord. Struggling, relationship wise. Oh, my God. Stagnant. Religious. Andre, come stand down there with your family, son. Don't Lord, let your family come stand down there. Come down there with Jack. Lord, come on, Andre. You. Your daughter and your wife are standing there, son. Don't leave your family standing up there by yourself. Priest, prophet, and king that you are. Lord, oh, my God. Thank you, Lord. I bind the devil in the name of Jesus. Woo, nothing shall come now. Oh, my God. Nothing shall come now. Nothing shall come now between their union right now in the name of Jesus. I curse every demonic and unclean thing that will come against that union right there in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood upon Jackie, Andre, and Bree right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, my God, my God, my God. My God, my God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for responding, son, to your pastor's voice. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. Ooh, thank you, Lord.
Roll away the stones, Stacy. Roll away everything. Leave it at the altar. Oh my God. Give me Come on, stretch your hands towards heaven. Oh my God. Hallelujah. Come on up, Bishop. Oh my God. Ooh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh my God. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Come on, y'all. Stretch. Come on, stretch. Come on, stretch. You're coming to release. When you stretch your hands towards heaven, that means you're releasing. You're releasing. You're releasing. Amen, Minister Antoinette. I saw in the spirit. Amen. Way to cover. Way to cover. Oh my God. Richard, come forth. Ooh, Richard, come forth. Peace be still in that marriage. The devil is alive. Can't have these marriages in this church. Start with mine. Ooh, thank you, Lord. Ooh, more of you. Ooh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, my God. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Come, Bishop, and pray. Keep your faith towards heaven, y'all. Don't get distracted. I see you, Sherrod. Come on, men. Come on, men. Oh, my God. Come on, men. Yes, Lord. Cry out to the Lord. It's okay. Oh, my God. Mm. Strength for the journey. Strength for the journey. Some of you need strength for the journey. Oh, my God. Mr. Goodwin, you need strength for the journey, sir. Oh, my God. I speak strength, Mr. Goodwin, over your life. Recharge, refire. Oh, my God. Go back and get it again, man of God. Abraham Lincoln fell many times over. Don't quit, Mr. Goodwin. Stay. Keep that tenacity. Keep that pursuit, man of God. Oh, my God. Recharge, my God. And go for it again, man of God. Oh, thank you, Lord. 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 Mm. Oh, Jesus. Remove, respond, release. In this moment in time, you have an opportunity to let the thing go that's held you back and bound you up and weighed you down for years, for years. In the realm of the spirit, when there is a moment in that moment, if you'll respond, all heaven opens up. Things begin to shift and change. Lift your hands one more time. Lift your hands one more time. From the depths of your being now, now, in this moment, let it go. You tried to do it. You tried to make it happen. Nothing ever happened. Let it go. Our Heavenly Father now says, I'm here. I will take it if you'll let it go. Let it go now. Let it go now. Let it go now. God, I give it to you. I give it to you. I remove it. I lay it at your feet. I release it, and I shall be released into my future. Now, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Why are you holding it? Let it go. Why are you holding on to it? Let it go. Let it go now in the name of Jesus. 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 I let it go. The stone, the hindrance is being removed, is being removed, is being removed. Let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. There, there, it's free. Daughter, I free it. I free you. New day, new day, 
new day, new day. Don't ever look back again. Don't ever look back again. Don't ever look back. Free. 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 Don't pick it up. You let it go. Don't pick it up again. Don't pick it up again. A new day, 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 a new day. Some history will not repeat itself. It's a new day. It's a new day. It's a new day. Come on. There, there, there. Weep today because joy's coming in the morning. Joy's coming in the morning in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Take it, it's yours. It's yours. It's yours. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. God, I thank you today. In this house, in this Sunday after Resurrection Sunday, we're coming out. We're coming out of everything that's held us back, everything that's weighed us down, everything that tried to hinder our future. We're coming out. This entire church is coming into a refreshing in the Holy Ghost, a refreshing in the Holy Ghost, a refreshing in the Holy Ghost, a refreshing. Bring her right here. Bring her. Bring her. Come on. This is your day. This is your day. This is your day. The weight and heaviness that's been on you way too long is coming off of you. You say, why have it been done for others? And I, I, It's yours today. Just lift your hands right now. It's yours today. It's yours today. 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 There, receive it now. 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 In the name of Jesus. Burn it away, Jesus. Now I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm going to pray a prayer to seal the work of God. We don't have a moment so that we go back to where we came from. We have a moment so we don't have to return. So lift your hands one more time. Before we go from this place, I'm asking God to seal in the realm of the Spirit what He accomplished today. When God accomplished it, it is a finished work. When Jesus said it was finished, it was finished. Now I'm telling you as we pray this prayer, it is finished. What you've been battling, what you've been going through, what you've been carrying is finished. We're going to seal it by the Spirit. Amen. Father, now I pray over this congregation and over these that have been at this altar. They have come to remove, to respond, and to release. Now I pray, seal it in the Spirit. Seal the work today, here and now, by the power of the Holy Ghost. And Father, we vow to give you all the praise, all the praise, all the honor, all the glory in the name of Jesus. Come on, if you believe that, give the Lord a shout. Give the Lord a shout. Let the enemy know his day is over. This is God in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus.